We're now going to look at a fourth asymptotic notation called the little o notation, which is analogous to the big O notation, but it's a notation that is used much less frequently. Recall that big O of f of n was defined to be the set of all functions with either a smaller or the same order of growth as the function f of n. For example, big O of n square is the set of all functions with a smaller or the same rate of growth as n square. So it contains functions like to n square, 2 n square, 3 n square, 10 n square, half n square and so on. These are all functions which have the same rate of growth as n square, which is why they belong to the set big O of n square. Then there are other functions like 100 n plus 5 log n, 100 log n, 100 n plus 50 log n, and so on. These are functions with a smaller rate of growth than n square, which is why these functions are also in big O of n square. A little o of f of n is defined to be the set of all functions with a smaller rate of growth than f of n. So notice the difference between this definition and the definition of big O of f of n. Big O of f of n not only contains functions with a smaller rate of growth than f of n, but also functions with the same rate of growth as f of n. Little o of f of n does not contain functions with the same rate of growth as f of n. It only contains functions that are that have a decidedly smaller rate of growth than f of n. For example, the function n square is not present in the set little o of n square because n square has the same rate of growth as n square. Similarly, a general quadratic expression like a n square plus b n plus c for um, some constant a greater than 0 is not in little o of n square because a quadratic function also has the same rate of growth as n square. But if you look at these other functions like this linear function 100n plus 5 or this logarithmic function log n, these are functions that have a smaller rate of growth than n square. And so they are present in the set little o of n square. Here are two examples of functions 2n and 2n square, both of which are in big O of n square. 2n is in big O of n square because it has a smaller rate of growth than n square. 2n square is in big O of n square because it has the same rate of growth as n square. But 2n is in little o of n square because it has a smaller rate of growth than n square. And 2n square is not in little o of n square because it has the same rate of growth as n square. We can also provide a uh, a set theoretic definition of this set little o of f of n very similar to how we defined the set big O of f of n. Big O of f of n was defined to be the set of all functions t, t of n such that t of n can be upper bounded by some constant multiple of f of n. So t of n can be upper bounded by some constant multiple of f of n and this of course applies to values of n that are sufficiently larger than some threshold, some positive threshold n naught. But the thing to notice here is that we are talking about the existence of some constant for which t of n is upper bounded by c times f of n. It's possible that there could be other constants for which this does not hold. It may not hold for all constants. For example, um, 
if you take a function like 3n square, now 3n square is in big O of n square. But 3n square cannot be upper bounded by any constant multiple of n square. You have to choose a constant multiple of n square where the value of the constant is greater than or equal to 3. If, if I choose a value of c that is say 2 or half or 1 fourth, 3n square is not going to be upper bounded by 1 fourth of n square. So in the definition for big O of a function f of n, we are talking about the possibility of there being a constant multiple of f of n upper bounding our given function t of n. But in the definition of little o of f of n, the constant, uh, we are not just talking about the existence of some constant, we are saying that for all constants c greater than 0, t of n is going to be upper bounded by some constant multiple of f of n for n that is large enough. Now this, this is similar, this is actually uh, this can be understood from this previous way in which we defined little o of f of n. If a function has a smaller rate of growth than f of n, then you can you can multiply f of n with any constant you like. You can you can multiply f of n with as small a constant as you like, as long as the constant is greater than zero f of n is sooner or later going to overtake your function. Right? So if, 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 I, if I take this function for example 100n plus 5, 100n plus 5 is going to be overtaken by any constant multiple of n square. So I could take 1 over 10 to the power 50 times n square. Even this function is eventually going to overtake 100n plus 5. It will do so at a very large value of n. So the value of n naught here, the threshold beyond which the upper bound is valid, the threshold is going to be very large. But there will still exist a threshold beyond which, beyond which this constant multiple of n square is going to upper bound 100n plus 5. So it doesn't matter what constant we choose. For all constants c, for all constants c, cn square is going to eventually become an upper bound for a function that is growing slower than n square. That is why the difference between little o of f of n and big O of f of n is just in this slight change from there exists a constant c greater than 0 to for all constants c greater than 0. Since big O of f of n is not only containing functions that have a smaller rate of growth than f of n, it also has functions that have the same rate of growth as f of n. If you look, if you focus only on those functions which have the same rate of growth as f of n, then, it, then we necessarily require a there exists here because those functions are not going to be upper bounded by, by any constant multiple of f of n. They will, the, the constant will need to be large enough for the upper bounding to be valid. But in little o of f of n, the definition of little o of f of n, the value of the constant doesn't matter. As long as the value is greater than 0, sooner or later, t of n is going to be upper bounded by that constant times f of n. So this is easy to see that if a function t of n belongs to the set little o of f of n, it must also belong to the set big O of f of n. Because if for all constants c, 
t of n is going to be upper bounded by c times f of n, then clearly there exists a constant c for which t of n is going to be upper bounded by c times f of n. So any function that is in little of f of n is also going to be in big O of f of n. Alternatively, if a function has a smaller rate of growth than f of n, it is obviously going to have a smaller rate, smaller or the same rate of growth as f of n. And both kinds of functions are in big O of f of n. So if there's a function that has a smaller rate of growth than f of n, because of which it's present in little o of f of n, it's also going to be present in big O of f of n. The converse is not true though. You could have a function in big O of f of n, but which is not in the set little o of f of n. And that's because there could exist a constant c greater than 0, such that t of n is upper bounded by that constant times f of n. But this doesn't mean that for every constant c greater than 0, t of n is going to be upper bounded by c times f of n. Maybe there is a uh, maybe there is only a particular range of constants, say c greater than three, greater than or equal to three. Only for constants greater than or equal to three, uh, for example, uh, is three n square going to be upper bounded by c times n square. So you could have a function that is in big O of n square, but which is not in little o of n square and so the converse doesn't apply.